Everybody ready? Yeah. I know you're excited since it's the last lecture. Your Monday nights will be your own again. But uh, thanks for showing up. We'll get started. There'll be a few people trickling in later. Uh, before I introduce our guest, I just wanted to uh, say thanks for coming. Uh, this is our last Monday night lecture here. I think we've, you know, I think we covered a quite a bit of ground. We started out just talking about what the definition of news is for you know, those who hadn't been familiar with it. We talked about all kinds of uh, newsroom structures, uh, types of news stories from narrative features to the interviews, and we talked about some tips for interviewing. And if you recall, we spent some time talking about the, uh, the ethical traps that you know, journalists can get into and that you guys are all going to avoid. Uh, you know, I gave you those examples that went on of, you know, with plagiarism and ethical lapses at various newspapers, including mine and Brian's. Uh, so uh, that, that was a good session. And, you know, Ed Gargan and I did the session on international relations, and you guys asked a lot of questions there, so I think that was helpful. And of course, we had uh, Sundar, the editor of the Holly Times, who gave a terrific lecture on uh, disaster reporting. And uh, we kind of went through the gamut here. Juliana Liu gave us a really nice one on uh, writing for broadcast from, uh, from her experience, both at Warriors and BBC. Um, and we've had other, you know, you know other uh, uh, great lectures. Brian gave us a great one on how to write for now these days, write for different digital platforms. And you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, I think we've covered a lot of ground. And uh, you know, thanks for coming and being attentive and asking so many great questions. Um, we're going to wrap it up. You know, I always say, like to save the best till last. And so unless it's our last uh, lesson, I've invited uh, uh, Yumiko Ono here. Well, if you if you uh, read the piece that I actually attached earlier, you'd know that, uh, first of all, she is not Yoko Ono. <laughs> Although people in New York get confused because she only used her first initial and her last name when she moved to New York. But she can give you a bit more about her background because maybe that she can tell a little bit about you know, how you can follow in her footsteps for those of you who are interested in business news. But she's currently the... Uh, Asia dig Digital Editor for Dow Jones, previously the Bureau Chief for uh, Dow Jones and the Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. in uh, uh, Tokyo, that's the Tokyo and Seoul uh, Bureau. She was also a correspondent there in Tokyo as well as in New York, uh, two of the major centers for covering business and finance. And she's going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, innovative things she's doing now as uh, the Asia dig Digital Editor and talk about some of the creative and interesting ways you tell business stories. So I think uh, we're really lucky to have uh, Yumiko Ono come with us for our final lesson. <laughs> Yumiko. Thank you. OK, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Yumiko Ono. I'm the Asia Digital Editor of the Wall Street Journal. Um, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do at the journal, what I have been doing. I've been with the uh, Wall Street Journal for more than 25 years, so a long time. Um, and maybe I'll start off by asking you guys a question. Um, since I'm a journalist, my profession is to ask questions, and I will take some questions later on. But how many of you read the news in paper? How many of you subscribe to a paper? OK, <laughs> zero. So, OK, but read the paper then. Yeah. Read in paper form. One, <laughs> two, three, OK, four. OK, we have, we have a, a handful of people. How many solely online you, you get the news online? OK, most people, yeah. How about you know, TV is my only, the, the only way I get the news, or the predominant way I get the news? OK, nobody. So online, um, that's kind of that transformation. You know, 20 years ago, of course, most people would have um, read the paper as their main way of getting the news, uh, plus, you know, watch TV or whatever, but how times have changed. And I'll start a little bit by telling you about how I got into the business. Um, I am from Japan, and I grew up in the US, in New York, and in London. Um, my dad worked for a bank, and I went from one place to other, another. I went back to Tokyo to go to college. In those days, Japan was such a secluded country that if you were to get a university degree outside of Japan, they wouldn't recognize it as a university degree wh wherever it was that you went. But if you went to a college in Japan, that would be recognized <laughs> around the world. So we decided to go back to Japan. And during, um, in those days, this was in the late 80s, um, there was no equal opportunity for women. In fact, so much that they were going to introduce a new law called the Equal Opportunity Law 
that would, for the first time, give women in Japan the opportunity to be on the same track as the men if they really wanted to. But when I went to talk to a lot of companies, I found there was a lot of confusion and some reluctance, and you know, not really sure of what the companies wanted out of the women that they were going to put on the equal opportunity track now that there was a law. Uh, so I thought, okay, I am not so sure about my future with a Japanese company. Why don't I? I know how to speak English. I also went to a, an interpreting school just to, you know, have some sort of skills that I could、uh, make use of. So why don't I become an interpreter and go around to some companies with、um, the people that I interpret for, and maybe I could. See some companies, and if there's a good one, maybe I could try to join that one. So I got into interpreting as a way to see the world and see how businesses were run. And one of the first places that I、uh, did my interpreting practice was the Wall Street Journal.、Um, there, the, in the Tokyo bureau at that time, there were foreign correspondents who didn't speak any Japanese. Now they were assigned from New York or from. In my case, I was assigned to a reporter. From、uh, who was in Detroit before, and they were going to be in Tokyo and cover the story for a couple of years, and then maybe go back to another city.、Um, that was the time when Japan was just beginning to enter the phase now called the bubble, and so that was when Japan suddenly swept up to the the front of people's attention, and that's when people started,、um, you know, buying up uh, Columbia, uh, the movie studio, or Rockefeller Center or、um, MCA, and so there was a lot of demand for Japan stories. And at the same time, I found that oh, it's so fun to be asking your own <coughs> questions rather than interpreting other people's questions. Why don't I try, if I can, try to write a story on my own? So I was, you know, technically the interpreter and the news assistant, and I also did the office books and stuff. But on a slow summer day, I attempted. With a lot of help from the foreign correspondent,、uh, my first story, and that was so fun. I, I still remember it. I took I don't know weeks to do a story that was just this big in the paper, but it was about I don't know economic novels in Japan or some something like that. And my first draft was all it was a bunch of quotes and no nut graph. But well, I mean the that got cleaned up, and you know I learned how to write a story. And that was just so fun that、um, I got into keeping my own projects on the side. And if there were some things that people did not want to write about, like the daily stock market co- comment, then I would volunteer, put my hand up high, that oh, of course I'll do the daily stock market comment. I would love to do the daily stock market comment. And that's kind of how I started as a reporter.、Um, and、uh, after a couple of years, I actually got a position as a Tokyo correspondent. And that's when I started to want to work in the New York headquarters because I worked for an American newspaper, and I had never, you know, actually worked in in the country where most of our readers were from. So I sort of,、um, after a few years, I did get to go to New York, and I covered the media marketing.、Um, I was in the media marketing、uh, group, so I covered things like. Food companies, the cosmetics companies, marketing and retailing and advertising, and that's when I、uh, did a, a lot of my, you know, some the most fun work that I've done. Of course, I did a lot of fun work in、um, Japan as well, but I wrote stories about how you know Kool Aid, the American drink, it's a powder, and you kind of put it in water, and it becomes this、um, vivacious-looking red and orange and purple and blue drink. Um, well, there were some college kids that were using Kool-Aid to dye their hair. It was a cheap hair dye; they had to use a lot of it. The one without sugar was better, and so I interviewed people like that.、Um, I did stories on, you know, management changes and、um, how the retailing logistics worked and things like that. So I've done that. I came back to Tokyo and got married.、Um, I was in Tokyo for a very long time, doing reporting and editing and bureau chiefing, and for the for about five years, I also launched and ran the Japanese language edition of the Wall Street Journal. And I came to Hong Kong about that. That was an entirely different challenge to 
present the Wall Street Journal, which is very English and American and global, into Japanese for the Japanese audience, who, who didn't necessarily um, feel comfortable reading the Wall Street Journal in English. And I came to Hong Kong about a year ago to do uh, social media and audience engagement, which is a completely new area to what I've been doing before, which was you know launching the Japanese language website. But this is a new and exciting area to be in. And since September, I've also taken on the video department. So I now do video and lots of digital strategy and um, keeping social media. So I'm a jumble of things. Um, so I have a lot of experience in you know different kinds of uh, doing business reporting. And a lot of it has been fun. A lot of it has been, you know, somebody was asking me uh, before I got here, well, don't you have to be um, a, a professional, like uh, know a lot of a specialist in the areas that you're covering? But a lot of what I covered, uh, you know, before I got here was just being on the beat. So one thing I would say to you all is that once you get on the beat, you know, I never thought that I would learn so much about food companies when I was covering food. But I went to the supermarket on a daily basis and looked at the labels and I, you know, I know how to look at the labels and can tell, oh yeah, this carrageen and that, that's like a seaweed and you know, it's kind of there. If you're trying to um, reduce the calories in your snack, then you put that stuff in there. The, this stuff like that, the stuff you learn on a beat for business reporting is, is pretty interesting. Um, so I would um, encourage you all to just, you know, don't, you don't need to think too much about, oh, I need to be a specialist to begin with. That once you get a beat or you have an assignment, then that's where it all begins. So um, um, I can talk to you a little bit about some of the uh, stories that the Wall Street Journal has done uh, fairly recently. And I want to talk today about different kinds of business reporting and some of them, the most fun stuff, you know, just like my Kool-Aid story or my Yoko Ono story or um, lots of stories I've done in Japan about how the Japanese were coming to terms with themselves and a new kind of post-bubble crash era. I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about some of the most recent stories that we've done uh, on different, different aspects of business journalism. So the first story that I want to talk to you about, this uh, Rain Man in Trouble, the unraveling of Tom Hayes. Does anyone know who Tom Hayes is? Is he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's like the face of global financial crime, right? And so what for um, the rest of you, Tom Hayes is a former banker. He used, worked at UBS. He worked at Citibank. He was very, very good at what he did. But what he was doing in London when he was at Citibank was he uh, he he was nudging the the interbank rate called LIBOR along in his favor so that it gave him a little bit of an edge when he was trading, and he was hardly the only person doing it. I mean, there was this whole thing called the LIBOR scandal a couple of years ago that. You know, it went on and on, and people found out more and more people were involved, and it was a really big deal in the business community and the financial community. But what people were doing, you know, as people found out more and more about this, we learned that, oh, it wasn't just, we first, we thought it was just a group of people. Oh, no, it wasn't that. Everybody knew, oh, oh, okay. Oh, it wasn't just one bank, it was lots of banks. Oh, and they talked to each other and passed on information. They all nudged the LIBOR in one direction or the other. How could this work? But this is a story also about a person. This is Tom Hayes right here. And the reporter, David Enrich, was a banking reporter, and he got incredible access to Tom Hayes. It was like a journalist's dream. Everybody in journalism would love to have the kind of access that David en Enrich did for this story. And this story uh, was, is about how he kind of got to know Tom Hayes and kept in touch with him. And soon um, Tom Hayes started to confide in him, not only Tom, but then his wife, who's a corporate lawyer, started texting him as well. And soon, um, David knew all about Tom Hayes and what he was going through. 
so this is it ended up becoming a five-part series on uh, the life of Tom Hayes as he stood by his trial that went on for about 10 weeks or so it went on for quite a long time and you know the emotional pressure that he was under as every day he had to go to court and stand on on trial and try to defend the actions that he's taken so this is a great story one of the beauties of uh, one of the ways to make business reporting really interesting is to focus on a person you know not just anybody but a person that symbolizes something that you want to you know the topic that you want to talk about and everybody wants to know about the LIBOR scandal but if you just explain how it works it could get a little bit technical <coughs> so it really helps to have somebody like a person um, as a way to focus on your story and to tell the story the writing style is very friendly yeah. and simplified terms and you get to know all about Tom Hayes so if you haven't already I would urge you to uh, take a look at this story it's quite long but um, you'll get through it very quickly so what happened with Tom Hayes is that when he was at Citibank um, he, he manipulated the LIBOR and then he got fired but when he got fired he didn't feel so like he did something so bad and he thought oh okay so I got fired but I will move on but then he found out that he was going to be charged for fraud by the, by the UK government and his friends and wife and um, everybody he knew urged him to plead guilty and cooperate with the UK government so that he would give the government more information but then he won't have to serve a sentence but soon he found that he was also going to be charged by the US and that was a really big deal um, and while he was uh, deciding to cooperate with the governments he actually realized hang on wait a minute I don't feel like I've done something so bad and he was going he was a gambler he he liked to do you know um, think about numbers he was very good at math and he actually opened up a whole bunch of accounts on online gambling sites and things like that but he thought that he could game the system and actually suddenly while he was saying oh I'm guilty I'm guilty I'll cooperate with you UK government um, he suddenly decided no actually you know what I'm not guilty I'm not guilty I take it all back I'm not guilty and I'm gonna fine you know go to trial um, I will fight for myself I'll get a lawyer and because this was not I just you know what I did unknowingly was something that everybody was doing and I don't feel that I should be guilty so even though at first he was going to plead guilty to fraud because he didn't want to be locked up he learned just how widespread the maneuvering of the rate was and became convinced of his innocence and you know who does that kind of thing right so um, this is also a story about how one person could first go from oh I'm guilty I'm gonna cooperate to hang on I'm not guilty I'm gonna fight the system and you're you're all wrong and I was I'm a victim and the the maneuvering was widespread so it's a really risky bet that he he made another thing in the story that comes up is a lot of this legal procedure what do you do when you have to defend yourself in court uh, and it it's a friendly way to take you through that whole system as well so that's why it's really good to have a person in the middle of the narrative um, it talks about how he wore the same clothes every day because those were his lucky clothes but you know you can't just wear the same clothes every day so he would always wash his shirt in the evenings after he got done with the the trial for the day it also talks about a lot lots and lots of details about Tom um, what he was like you know that he was a little bit he was good with numbers but he wasn't really good with people and he would um, avoid eye contact usually uh, things like here oh sorry if you could go back to that picture he's setting up shop in his kitchen table um, he stacked documents next to his son's placemat and uh, salt and pepper shakers 
and he was fueled by endless cups of tea that kept him going and he you know he was meticulous and he liked documents so he looked at all these documents one by one and he built an interactive database that cataloged the mountains of evidence uh, that kind of thing uh, the story also talks to the lawyer against him saying that boy you know that, that he actually enjoys the process of interrogating or in, uh, interviewing the, the defendant and says, oh my God, Tom Hayes, he's terrible um, on trial, on the stand. So even the lawyer who's against him thinks that he, he's quite terrible. He, he doesn't like to, you know, he doesn't do a good job of convincing others to feel um, um, sorry for him or to, to to be on his side. He goes off on <coughs> tangents and he's just not very good with people. Another thing you might wonder is, well, his wife is a corporate lawyer and how could she kind of sit next to this guy, her husband, who's committed this massive fraud most likely? But you kind of get inside her head too about how she felt that, you know, she felt very <coughs> loyal to him and how she felt that he was doing, um, she would stand by him, that she thought he was quite courageous to, to take the stand and you know, maybe she wouldn't agree with everything that he was doing, was convinced and she was determined to uh, be on his side throughout the whole process. So this is kind of a, uh, it, this was all possible because there was so much great access and look, it just goes on and on, uh, but uh, it's, it's a very good story told in a very friendly manner. The sentences are quite short and it reads like a story. Um, but this like is a fiction. way, mm -hmm. yeah, it's like fiction except it's not. <laughs> and it also talks about um, the reporter comes into the story too, which is another interesting way of engaging the readers. You don't just read as though the reporter's not just stepping back and said, here's the story and I reported it, but you know, usually the reporter never um, comes into the story. There's never an I, the reporter did this and that. But there was so much uh, messaging. You know, Tom Hayes would meet the reporter time and time again and text him kind of obsessively, even w while he was on trial, right after uh, he was on trial, things like that. So there's some of this going on I am going to win this case, Tom Hayes says, to David Enrich, the reporter. And in orange, anything new that gives you confidence? You know, the reporter has to be neutral, so, um, you know, don't be totally egg him on or anything, but, and, oh, what, what is going on? I'd like to know. Yes, but need to see you to talk about it. I'm not sure you will even get to trial. You know, that he, um, at this particular moment, Tom Hayes is feeling very confident that he could win and he may not even go to trial. Other times he's very depressed and he, he just wants to talk. His wife also just wants to talk. So this is an example of, um, of a story that has everything that a journalist would ever want. You know, so much information from the main person who is usually difficult to get to and who, can, who has a lot to say. But I would urge you to read the story also because it has, he talks to everybody too. And in the process of this, you know, you can't just talk to Tom Hayes and do the whole story. You have to talk to his wife, you have to talk to the lawyers, you have to talk to um, the companies and get their comments and things like that to round out the story. But it just becomes a very rich tale full of details, including uh, what color socks he liked to wear and what he liked to eat and that he had such a dandruff problem that one of his girlfriends gave him a special shampoo at one point. But all of this um, <laughs> um, um, makes it a very rich story. Okay, so that was the Tom Hayes story. The next uh, two sets of stories that I'm going to share is about e-commerce. And there are two different aspects to e-commerce that I'll talk about. The first is a story, a series of stories on Alibaba, and the next one is about e-commerce in India. Now, for the Alibaba story right here, uh, this was a story that uh, was published about a year ago uh, before Alibaba's big IPO when they sold stocks in the market. It was the biggest stock offering uh, ever. So th this is 
a way to do business reporting when the company won't talk to you or cooperate, but you still feel that you have a good story to tell. Well, how do you tell such a story? And this was a story about Alibaba. You know, everybody wants to know about Alibaba. Everybody, a lot of people had, even in the U.S., had heard of Alibaba, even though they didn't know exactly. You know, they may not know or have anything to do with Alibaba, but they had heard the name. They may have heard about Jack Ma, the very colorful、um, leader of Alibaba. And one of the things that was becoming an issue, particularly for the brands. That sold on one of the internet sites, Taobao, were the fakes. That you know, you all know that Alibaba. If you go to Taobao, sometimes you you don't get the real thing, right? But、um, how do you tell that story? And of course, this is not the kind of story that Alibaba would want to talk about. So they didn't really cooperate with this story. But how we told the story is first of all to focus on. When you focus on a company, try to figure out who it is that would talk to you, and we found that the people that would talk to us were the people who actually were the the brands that everybody knew about、uh, that sold on Taobao, but had to、uh, deal with a lot of competitors who sold fake versions of their products at much lower prices. So there were companies like. Uh, Columbia or Dahon, the the company that sold folding bicycles,、um, it was a U.S. based company that se- sold、uh, folding bicycles on Taobao.、Uh, that you would still be able to come up with an intriguing story by talking to these brands first of all, and just getting a sense of what these brands had to do to fight against all these competitors selling fake ver- knockoff versions of their products. So at Dahon, what they did was they hired four full-time staffers just to monitor and fight the counterfeits. So they would have this process every day where these four full-timers would try to find other、um, companies that sold on Taobao fake. You know, oh yeah, this is fake. So if they can tell, then they try to retaliate. Or they also had these investigators go to the stores posing as customers, sometimes wearing wigs. As a disguise, and they would go and buy, and they would, you know, know that way that oh, these were fakes. It also talks to the people who are selling the fakes. So you can't just talk to the brands that are doing, trying to do something about it.、Um, so in this story, there is one man who was selling a backpack with a Disney character on it, but the logo didn't say Disney; it said D T E N or D I T E Y N. So、um, the reporter asked the man selling the stuff. Well, this doesn't seem to say Disney. Is it a fake? And the man said, "Oh, oh, I bought it from a wholes in the、uh, wholesale market, but I didn't know it was a fake, and don't know if the company has the rights to use the Disney characters. He's just selling the stuff." And we also got Disney's comments, who said that some of the products of this man that we talked to. Are genuine, but couldn't comment on the particular backpack that had the logo DTN on it.、Um, Al- even though Alibaba wasn't cooperating with the story, there were there was a lot of public information that we could use in the story. For instance, Alibaba was named by the U.S. Trade Representative in its list of the notorious companies for counterfeit、uh, selling counterfeit goods. So Alibaba had to submit a report saying that oh we're going to make these improvements and that's why you need to take us off this list. And in this uh, report um, that we got a copy of, it said what it was doing, how it would found find the、uh, counterfeits in you know seven days or less, and these are the procedures that they would go through to get rid of them, and how they're making improvements and lots of progress here and there. We also looked at some of the online presentations that Alibaba had to the Western companies to get a sense of what it was saying to others, what it was doing.、Uh, this was also a digital package, so we decided to have some fun with it. In addition to this main story here, we also had a quiz: Can you spot which item is real versus fake? We also had, <laughs> and here are the four examples that we had. Uh, we also had 
the Wall Street Journal's unscientific shopping spree, which is the next story. The Wall Street Journal went shopping on Taobao. And what we did here is uh, the reporters bought the same product at different price tags. For instance, there was a North Face fleece jacket selling at $25 and $60, even though the real thing in a regular retail store costs more than $100. And then when they were buying the products, they would send a message asking the sellers whether the products were authentic. And guess what? The reporters did not hear back from the sellers. Um, subsequently, the listings were dropped. Oh, OK. But in any case, they got these, um, they got the North Face fleece jackets. Uh, when placed by, side by side, they found that the fake jackets were of a much different color than the real thing. And they had separate labels sewn onto them. The product tag said that the jacket was part of the Summit series, but the label sewn on the jacket said they were from the Flight series. So that's kind of a little bit um, suspicious, right? Uh, we also got these Tory Burch wallets, uh, three kinds, I think, both, all of which were priced much lower than the $350 that Tory Burch usually sold uh, her <laughs> wallets at, and found that there was a receipt in one of them that looked like it was, it came from the IFC shopping mall. But when you looked at it very closely, instead of saying paid, P-A-I-D, it said fade, F-A-I-D. Hmm. And the phone number, when we called the phone number that was on the receipt, it wasn't the Tory Burch store. It was the number for Elaine Crawford. So of course, you can't stop there. You have to do the whole thing. So you have to go and get comment from Tory Burch. And you have to go to the um, Lane Crawford store and check out whether that wallet was really purchased from there. And it didn't seem to be the case. Well, we did everything we could. And you know, it was kind of interesting. Um, this was a fun story by the reporters to say, oh, well, look at this one on the right. And look at that one on the left. And, the colors of these two mm, the awfully cheap Tory Burch wallets, they, they, they look different. And the smell, one of them smelled more plasticky than the other. And they had different kinds of, um, one came with you know carefully wrapped in a fine paper, and another, the other one didn't. So all kinds of things that you could find. Um, this is you know by talking to even though the company itself didn't cooperate so much, by talking to so many people that also sold on Taobao, we were able to get a nice, good, round picture of what the situation was. And we had fun on the side um, just talking about you know, doing our own shopping and comparing. OK, now, so the last uh, story that I want to talk to you about is to focus on a process. And we do these stories. I call them the yarn stories. But to make some, you know, some of the most intriguing things about business stories is, well, how does it work? So you saw some of that in the the Tom Hayes story of, well, how does this? What makes this guy tick? You know, how does a court process work? But in this last batch of stories, it's about, well, how does e-commerce work anyway in a place like India? Um, and what we did is we followed, you know, we were seeing that, oh, in e commerce in India, there are a lot of companies that want to get in on this. They want to actually become the Alibaba of India. And there are a lot of companies investing a lot of money into this vast country. Uh, but is it all worth it? And is India prepared? And can they make money? Because not everybody seems to be making any money in India. Does it really make sense to get something that doesn't cost so much all the way across India on a plane and trucks and you know the roads aren't that great? Well, what does that look like anyway? So this was kind of a reporter idea during a brainstorming when um, they were talking about how they could best show in the most interesting way um, what e-commerce was like in India. They came up with this yarn story. So this is the story 
of the journey of a $3 sari. And the owner of a hair salon in southern India went to a website one day and bought this sari. And that sari was, um, was in a warehouse 1,900 kilometers away in northwestern India. And so it's the story of this 1,900 kilometer journey from Surat in western India to this hair salon owner's um, home in Madurai in southern India. But during this process, more than 30 people handled the package. There were two overnight truck journeys, a long haul flight, and a motorbike ride on a bumpy road filled with potholes. And how do we know all that? It's because there were two reporters on this story following the sari all the way from point A, the warehouse, to point B, the hair salon owner's home. So I explained a little bit about the backdrop of why we wanted to do this story. Um, it's interesting also to look at this graphic here, where one reporter started off his journey at the warehouse, where, well, I mean, we found the company that would work with us, and the minute the woman in southern India uh, clicked by, um, and you know her details showed up, uh, we got permission to follow the sari and also have another reporter be at her home to be with her when the sari arrived. So one reporter, Sean McLean, started at the warehouse and got followed by taxi, the truck that had the $3 sari that she ordered. Um, it was a very uh, arduous journey and twice did Sean McLean uh, there was a flat tire once, there was an accident when the taxi went over what the taxi driver called a boulder, so oh, the flat tire. And once the taxi driver in the middle of the highway decided that, oh, I don't really want to go to where you said you wanted to go, so I'm just going to leave you here and not take you any further, so stranded on the highway in the middle of the night twice, but Sean got to know the, ta uh, the truck drivers pretty well and found that they had a very hard life and not much sleep and the long journeys and potholes and whatnot. Um, there was also a monsoon um, in the middle of this, uh, which meant that it was very, very difficult to make some of the journey. Um, the, the plane, it was very difficult, they learned to get the packages on the plane because s something like 10% of the packages were rejected for one reason or another. And if they can't make the plane, then you know you, that's, that's part of it. Well, here's the, the monsoon and what happened. Um, how difficult could it be for the truck carrying the $3 sari to um, make this journey through something like this? Um, after it gets off the plane, Sometimes there's only one truck a day that gets from where the sari is um, dropped off to the, the last leg of the journey. Then after the truck, there's the motorbike man. And this motorbike delivery man, uh, he carries a huge knapsack where he carries everything that he needs to deliver that day in it, whether it's a sari or dumbbells or whatever it is and carries the entire thing upstairs and wherever when, as he goes from delivery to delivery because he doesn't want anything stolen. So just imagine what the human effort is that goes through you know, handling this $3 sari from one place to another. Um, and if, let's say, after all that effort, the woman wasn't at home or something, and then that sari gets put back in the knapsack and the next day the delivery man starts all over again. And in India we found that, my god, this is really um, a difficult process because of the 500 deliveries that you might do in a single day, about 100 are returned for this company. So uh, it's still 
pretty much a work in progress. No wonder why companies aren't making so much money. Um, does it make sense? Well, people have to, you know, companies will have to come to a decision soon. Do we want to continue to invest because we want volume and lose money in the interim and, you know, not worry so much about that? Uh, but do we just uh, want volume or do we have to start charging more for the delivery fees in which case people might be turned off? Or do we not use planes and take more time with trucks only to deliver that $3, something like a $3, sorry. So this yarn story is a great way to show, you know, oh, th this is the kind of way you could show something interesting about business um, for, for the general audience. Uh, especially us out here in Asia, we have to figure out how to make readers maybe in the US or the UK or some far out place where people may not be interested in Asia or, or India or China or Japan. How do we get them interested? Well, here is a way that with visuals and you know the yarn um, process story that we could make a story come to life and to engage as many people in the audience as possible, as many of our readers as possible. So this is the kind of thing that we've been doing at the journal. Um, I could turn to questions or yeah. if. Do you want to pose the same one? Yeah, this is, this is the, ah, so this is the uh, reporter's notebook. I think this one, anyone could read yeah. anyway. But if you want to see what a reporter went through to get this story, I kind of gave you the highlights here. But I would encourage you to read this story by Sean McLean on you know what he had to go through, and he can. In this story, it tells you all about the what it felt like to be stranded twice in this three-day journey, um, while his colleague Newly Purnell um, stood by patiently waiting with the woman at the hair salon, waiting for that sorry to arrive. So, <laughs> can I ask the first question? Sure. Before you guys, fact, how many people does it take to work on these? Ah, that's a good uh, question. So we have, writers, yeah, yeah. Writers, this else? one, these are quite labor intensive. Yeah. If, yeah. So for this story, there were two reporters, Sean and Newly, and then there was a videographer who um, went along with Sean on this arduous journey, um, <laughs> braving the monsoon and whatnot. And then there are a few editors that work with the reporters. Um, there's the, your immediate editor, but I think there, we have a, a, the team in Hong Kong is separated into a topics. So there could be a corporate reporter, they're all within business, but corporate reporter, finance, uh, finance chief, corporate editor, um, markets editor, etc. And this was looked at by one of the corporate editors who kind of guided the reporters through, talking them through. And then there are other layer of editors in the New York headquarters who would vet the story and <laughs> make sure that there are no holes in there. And you know, we talked to everybody and got comments and all so that kind of it thing. Take? It took quite a bit of time, <laughs> weeks. Yeah. Weeks, yeah, yeah. And if you think about it, you know, it it could be a coincidence, but actually, it was the whole process was thought through quite carefully because we wanted this journey to be um, to show some of the more dramatic aspects of traveling in India so we wanted something that was heavy but not so expensive mm -hmm. and we wanted it to travel kind of across right. India yeah. so you know we, we needed that, that plane ride right <laughs> I saw a few hands Becca and, no, I was gonna ask if there were also other shorter stories coming up during the reporting there, like in these, in the week? Oh, days. yes, yes. So um, more for the Alibaba story. One story leads to the next one. And while they were doing the fake story and getting to know all these people at luxury brands, um, they came across um, a couple of stories. One was called the gray market story. And that's where, you know, not everything is, um, if you're, I don't know about Hong Kong, but in Japan, you're only supposed to buy from the Japan office or Japan store. 
but there are all these people who import from Europe or the U.S. at a cheaper price, and there was all that going on. And you know, can you actually are those fakes, or some are genuine, but what's allowed and what's not? There's also another big story that came out of that called、uh, blushing, and these were people who、um, I think it's a number of、uh, fans that you know you can manipulate the number of、uh, people who who like a product or some, some, something like that. But one story idea leads to another, and it just keeps going. So it's a great way to you know as you do the reporting, you just keep getting more and more and more stories. Tom,、um, yeah. Because it was such a long time. Also, the reporting took such a long time. Yes. And and it probably went a lot deeper the relationship than even the reporter expected. Does the angle keep changing, or like when do you decide to? Okay, oh, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, especially you know this is real time, so you can't like go dark for months, right? Yeah, you're so if you're a reporter. So there are lots and lots and lots and lots of Tom Hay stories. Anyway, in the in the、uh, course of this, there were spot stories. You know, there was the trial, so the regular stories, and at the end of it all, there was this. Yeah. So I mean, you you need to do both, especially, you know, now in the digital era. I mean, part of my job now is social media, so you have to keep you have to put stuff up on Instagram, and you have to tweet your story, and you know, you have to engage and do. Put up Facebook posts, so、um, it's important. To, it's very difficult to know because you want to keep everything until the last minute. But in this day and age, you have to come up with segments and you know different angles. But you could still save. I mean, this is an example that shows that even if you do the spot stories, you can still do the big story at the end. And some of it might overlap, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For the、um, first story, the yeah. Tom Hayes story.、Um, so how did the reporter know、um, Tom Hayes himself, and how did he make like a good relationship with him? And then, so that's the most specific question. Uh huh. And then this distance, you like become a good business reporter. Do you really have to be like kind of friends and or like <laughs> interacting with business people outside? To get good sources, you mean? I mean, I mean to be a good business. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, how did、um, David Enrich, the reporter, get to know Tom Hayes? He was writing a profile of Tom Tom Hayes because he really was becoming the, like the symbol of the LIBOR scandal.、Um, so he had reached out to a college friend, or it, it's in the story. Um, somebody who knew Tom and via and gave his email to her and via that person reached Tom and then、uh, luckily got a message from him because Tom Hayes wanted to talk to somebody at that time. But your second question about yes, of course you have.、Um, the more people you know, the better. And you never know, you know, business people can tell you not just about their business but about management styles and. About their their own, you know, a wide range of things. So, of course,、uh, it's very important to have、um, a, a wide range of sources on all levels:、uh, the people you meet for the first time, to the most trusted sources that you go back to again and again. Yeah. Yes.、Um, I wonder, did Tom know that、uh, these messages were going? I think I think that there are no surprises. So you know, there must have been. I don't know for sure, but I'd be surprised if he didn't know anything. Yeah, but usually,、um, in a relationship like that, the the reporter does you know tell him that I'm going to write a big story. It's going to have these things in it, or it, it's going to. I'm going to put some of this in, and yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, you should never surprise your sources like、um, like that by suddenly、um, pretending you're not going to do something and do something, or it's just not a good <laughs> good way to go about. Yeah. Okay.、Uh, we can tell that you are covering the business of eight Japan for years. 
Mm -hmm. And we kind of familiar with the Japanese enterprises culture from like the popular TV drama. Yeah. Hanzo Naoki. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 But we can tell that <laughs> it's very stressful trying to work for the companies in Japan. And we can see that the Japanese economy is undergoing setbacks these yes. years. So do you think that there are changes to um, to the Japanese enterprises and business to improve the situation? Yeah, um, Japan is definitely changing, but it's changing very slowly. And actually, you know, I told you about how um, when I was first looking for a job, it was the first, finally, the equal opportunity law. But now, Prime Minister Abe's goal is to have, what was it, 30% of uh, women as managers in, in a company, but some really ambitious goals. So that's kind of come a long way since then, right? But I'm, um, it's really tickling when, um, let's say, we write a big story about a Japanese company that's kind of critical, or it, you know, it's an in-depth look at a Japanese company. And then, of course, we translate it into Japanese for the, the language site that I was running. And then everyone can read it in Japan, right? And when that gets, um, starts getting around, and people comment on it, or there's reaction, then it really makes us feel good because you know we know that there is reaction and we are making a difference. So I think um, generally, yes, Japan is changing, but um, not that quickly, I'm afraid. Yeah. So you know there should be more. Um, I don't know. I just I just wish that there's more interaction and more kind of. Um, a closer look at what needs to be done. But do you think that the uh, Ambe economics and women economics proposed by Shinzo Abe yeah. really work effectively in Japan? I think, well, he just proposed it, mm -hmm. right? And, well, first of all, for Abe economics, if it's working or not, that's kind of a, it, it's a great question. And there are a lot of people who <laughs> say it's not. And then there are some people who say it is. But in any case, Japan's economy isn't doing that well right now. So, you know, the the um, it's unclear yet. But you know, we'll, we'll see. And as for the womenomics, I think that is seen. It's actually um, looked at more positively um, outside Japan than inside Japan. I was quite surprised to see. But I think any goal like that, at least it gets people moving. And I was quite surprised to see that big companies like Toyota, for instance, or s some of the, the more um, what we would consider to be you know, more conservative companies were actually taking this initiative to promote some women that Maybe they had this in the works for some time, but they, you know, they, it, it's kind of working on them. So in a situation like that, any goal setting might not be a bad idea just to encourage companies to you know, go along with it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cities, uh, the fact that they can IPO makes you know the article newsworthy. I, I guess my question: Why have you come to find a story like this before they decide to IPO? So we've done many, many stories about <coughs> Alibaba in the past, and when this was when the fake issue was becoming uh, more serious, and uh, some of the companies that we talked to were saying that, oh, the n number of competitors selling what we consider to be fake products has really increased recently. And there was more attention on Alibaba, so more of a reason to write about Alibaba. Now, we have a lot of reporters, but we don't have so many reporters that we can write an Alibaba fake story every day. <laughs> um, and timing-wise, since there was a lot of attention on Alibaba, we wanted to do our best Alibaba story that we could find on the hottest topic, the most 
you know, what was most talked about, and that was, that was it. So now there are lots of other stories that we could write <laughs> now that they're a public company, right? Yeah. So we'll just keep going, you know, there are a lot, and we can revisit the same topic after a while as well. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, actually, looking through your uh, CV on Korea, just we see that it's quite rich, but I assume that there were many challenging moments or failures in your professional life. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> <laughs> there are lots and lots of failures, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, there, there are times when you get beaten, there are times when you miss a story, you know, and somebody else, there's, oh, where do I start? It's, it's kind of, you know, you have to kind of suck it up and move on <laughs> all the time. But it's, at the end of the day, um, the, the most kind of humble moments are, it's very obvious, but when you miss a story or when you get beaten or somebody else has a great idea that you were going to do but just didn't get around to, I mean, those are the most humble moments that you feel like, oh, I should have, I could have done better and you beat yourself up. But then there are also moments when you do a story that um, you're really proud of and you worked hard to get that story and it, it sort of balances itself out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes? And how cautious do you have to be about putting a specific company, like talking too well about a specific company or too badly? Well, you have to, you're always, I mean, you're always casting this suspicious eye on yourself. So um, one thing that helps you is if you know that you have to talk to all parties concerned, then it's very difficult to be too positive or too negative because, it, I mean, sometimes a company has comment, you know, well, you say all this and you make it sound like we're, we're so bad, but we have a reason for doing what we're doing. And if you put that in, then it gives a balance. But, I mean, you can tell we read each other's stories very critically and um, tell each other, oh, oh, you're gushing about this story, or gosh, there's no, not enough fair comment in here. So that usually helps. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, the, the hair salon owner? Yeah. yeah. We actually have a lot of reporting that we've done before choosing this hair salon owner. And we found d during our reporting and after doing our reporting, we thought, okay, how we know the facts now. We're comfortable with what the situation is. What is one example to show um, what's kind of typical, you know, typically goes on? But we found that, we thought that for a story like, like the yarn story, it wasn't necessary to show examples of 50 people because they, you know, um, all we wanted to do was have one example that was fairly typical um, that would show the sari's journey. But, you know, for other stories, you might need to show a lot more examples so that you get, you give readers the full picture. So for th something like this, we ask the companies, we ask analysts. We don't just come up with a number on our own. Um, we do our reporting by asking as many knowledgeable people as possible. You know what they think, or can the people who are actually crunching the numbers or who are looking at the industry um, to give their best estimates for something like this. Okay. Yes. 
Being in charge of digital, um, do you also as an editor have to look into the performance rate of the articles you do on digital? If yes, what are the key metrics mm -hmm. and how do you monitor? Does this influence content you're putting up? Mm, those are really good questions. So some of the, of course, we look at traffic numbers. Um, we look at share numbers. But uh, some of it we have to um, take carefully because a lot of our stories are behind the paywall. It's for subscribers only. So then if you compare. Huh? We have noticed that, yes. <laughs> so if you have a story that's free for all versus a, a story that is for subscribers only, of course the traffic numbers are going to be higher for a story that's free for all, for everybody. But so you can't just look at the traffic numbers. Um, and you have to realize that, you know, if there's a story that you're very proud of and it's behind the paywall, then it may not get as much traffic as a story that's free for all. We also know that, well, if you just just look at traffic numbers, then um, a lot of the times it's not the the biggest news business stories that get the biggest traffic. It might be more a lifestyle story or a how to manage your money or that that kind of story so everything is taken you know relatively and we would say like oh for a story like this that's behind the paywall if it got this many shares and if this um traffic was about this much then that's pretty good you know that that's the kind of thing that we would say to ourselves so with behind the paywall with subscription do you see who as a subscriber reads on what kind of regular basis? For each subscriber, I don't have that level of detail. But we do get a sense of what are subscribers in general reading <coughs> versus what non-subscribers are reading. Or whether, you know, obviously the subscribers would be reading more stories on our site than non-subscribers who might just have come across a new story via social media or just happen to be searching for that you know, a, a story on that topic. So we do, we do things like this. But it's kind of a very experimental stage at this point where we have to take into account a lot of data points and try to figure out, oh, this kind of, you know, but there are, there are still trends even with this limited and lots of different factors to take into account. And one thing we've noticed is that, especially with mobile, you know, the screens are so small that we didn't think a story like, we weren't so sure how many people would read a five-part series like the Tom Hayes are long, long, long. And we actually found that, my God, a lot of people, a lot more than we expected, uh, read our stories on mobile, and a lot of it also came from social media. So, you know, we're very encouraged that our, the long-form journalism that we're very proud of and have a long tradition of um, writing uh, has been so well received. Yeah. Okay. Any more yes. Questions? <laughs> I thought I saw some more hands. <laughs> Nothing. Francis. Nobody. Just shaking his head. Ah, just one more. How do you decide which article will be on on paywall or That's that's decided by a bunch of editors. Um, Usually the core stories, the business stories and finance and a lot of the tech stories would be behind the paywall and more the lifestyle stories or the blogs and uh, videos and graphics would be free for all. But there are some, you know, tweaks even within business or within um, the graphics or the some are paid, some are not. Yeah, but a great, great question that everybody is trying to figure out right now. <laughs> I spent the weekend trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Any last question, or was that it? If that was our last question, please uh, join me in thanking our guest for spending time with me. Thank you. If you're not in a real hurry to get out, I'm sure oh. when we finish, some people come down and yeah, want to talk yeah, to you because sure, they were sure. too shy to. <laughs> yeah. Of course, just of take course. For a couple of minutes. Okay. And I'll just take just a minute uh, on behalf of Joe and Brian and myself to say thank you all for coming to this. We still have the labs coming up.
and you still have papers too. <laughs> so I will see you. But we'll all be around. I'll be around, especially I'm not going anyplace. I don't have any internships. So I'll be around if you need anything, come and chat with me. I'll be around. But this will be the last time we meet on a Monday night. I think you're here to see Darcy on uh, regular Mondays. But it's been fun for me. One of the fun things is getting to meet uh, all these great people I know in town. I get to invite in and get to chat with them because of you. And of course, meeting all of you. So thanks for coming. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.